Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, to all of you on the tube. Hope you're all today with Vivian Grand and Osmania World. I hope that point wasn't too aggressive, it felt it. I didn't mean it that way, but it was kind of like, you, in some kind of weird way, which it wasn't. I don't know. Anyway, hello everybody and welcome to another Q&A Wednesday. I don't know what that was. Strange, mystical movements. I will summon now the spirit of Fenog. Question one, they get on with it. Okay, question one. Uh, question one today is what do you think of Johnny Marr? I love Mr. Johnny Marr. Um, I don't play a lot of his stuff. Um, I have learned some of his stuff in the past, but not a great deal of it. But I love his songwriting. I love his guitar sounds. I love his guitar playing. And I love watching interviews with him. He's like incredibly insightful. Like ridiculous, and I, and I love some of the like you know things where he talks about guitars. There's an awesome video. Um, I mean, talking about the Jaguar. Um, I think it's on Fender's YouTube, but I could be wrong on that. But he's talking about his signature Jaguar, and that's just like one of the best interviews. Like with him, I love it, and the way he kind of talks about the guitar. It's just like, yes, I'll take, I'll take that. He's just a really cool guy, Johnny Marr is, and. You know, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't really play any style or anything like that. But he's inspired a lot of people who have inspired me, John Fashanti, Noel Gallagher. Um, but I, I love his playing. I love his sound as well. His sound is unreal, and his guitar parts are very unorthodox. They're very his own, and that cannot be ever sniffed at. He, he had his. He's got his own style, and he's got his own sound, and he's got his own approach to the guitar. And what Johnny Marr does is awesome. And what he does, he's the best at it. it you know, it, it, in my opinion, anyway. I mean, I, but I, say, I mean, I don't, I don't. There's quite a few guitarists who I absolutely adore, but I don't actually play any of their music, and I don't actually learn any of their music. I don't, I don't really know why. I just don't feel the draw to learn it. I just like to listen to it. If that makes any sense, it's straight. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's quite, a, you know. Quite a few guitarists out there who I absolutely adore the sound of, but like I don't actually learn the music. But um, I am going to learn some Johnny Marr though, because I want to do a How Many Tones video, because a lot of you requested How Many Tones can you get Johnny Marr out of Seattle 20. So uh, I will be learning some at some point, and I will be doing that out of Seattle 20 at some point. I've also requested Foo Fighters a lot, so I'm going to try and get to the Foo Fighters as well. But that's a different band. But yeah, Johnny Marr, I love Johnny Marr. He's just awesome. And like I say, he just does what he does. And that's cool. It's just cool. And I love his... It's so melodic. His playing is so melodic. And that just... And the melodies he comes up with, that, that that's it for me. It, 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 it's that thing I was saying about in, in previous videos. I'm sorry to ramble. Uh, but in like where, where for a guitarist or, or a piece of music to kind of like, you know, really interest me, it has to kind of go inside. And Johnny Marr's guitar playing does that. Um, not all of it, but most of it does. Um, it really does. So yeah, I mean, I I love it. I really do. It's really really cool. I love his guitar playing and, and yeah, the man himself. He's so cool. So uh, and I just wish I looked as cool as he did. But anyway, yeah. I uh, hope that's answered your question. And uh, going to move on to question two now. Okay, okay. So question two today is uh, how long would you say it takes a guitar to break in, and what are the benefits or advantages of this, and what are good upgrades to do to your guitars? Right. Um. How long does it take to a guitar to break in? Right, uh... I don't know, it's quite a difficult question to answer because all guitars are different. Some guitars you'll just pick up and it's just there straight away and there is that kind of like no breaking, getting used to it period. It's just done. That's it, you know. Um, whereas some guitars, it'll take you a couple of months or a couple of weeks or even a year to kind of get used to its foibles, so to say. Um, this guitar is an example of a guitar that as soon as I picked it up, I was like, that's just ridiculously nice and comfy. And it just immediately did everything I wanted to do. Whereas um, with something like uh, Les Paul like this, uh, which I'm not 100% you know, used to playing. I'm not really kind of like, you know, the biggest Les Paul user. This is the only one I play. I and mean, I only ever play it really in videos, outside of videos, I don't really play Les Pauls. Uh, this took a little bit longer for me to get used to. This probably took me... 
or maybe about half a year to kind of like get it the way I wanted it and to get comfy playing it. And of course, I obviously have to have the scratch play. So I don't know where, but I don't know about breaking period, but I think there's um. It's more like a, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, I'm going to say this, it'll probably sound really silly. I think it's more like a bonding period, more than anything else. You kind of like, you know, you, uh, you either bond with it straight away, or you kind of have to work at it a little bit. Um, I would say if, like, after a year, the guitar still isn't doing what you want it to do, and it still doesn't feel right, it still doesn't sound right, um, it's not for you. Um, but again, this is, all, this is all my own opinion, like, you know, I, I, I can only speak from you know, my perspective on that. But uh, I have had guitars. I bought a Fender Light Ash Telecaster uh, many, 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 many moons ago, and I really wanted a Telecaster um, from a local guitar shop. And uh, I played it in the shop, and it was great. And I walked out of the shop going, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I just had this weird feeling. I was like, I think I've made a mistake here. I got home, and I plugged it in, and I was like, it's rubbish. It felt rubbish. It sounded rubbish. The the grub screws in the saddles were loose and they rattled all the time. I just couldn't get used to it. And after about a year of trying with this guitar, I eventually sold it. I just I, it drove me mad. I literally wanted to throw it across the room at certain points. I just wanted to hurl it out the window. But um, and I never bonded with that. So I I'm not so sure about a breaking period, but definitely that was a bonding period. I would I would think where you kind of get used to the guitar, and you kind of get used to kind of like you know, its limits its limitations, what it does, what it doesn't do, kind of thing. Like, I know, for instance, what this can do and what it can't do. Like, um, and, and like, the same thing with Les Pauls and other guitars. And I think that's what it is. I think it's like a more of a bonding period and a breaking in period. Guitars, yeah, there is, um, if you play like an old guitar, there's definitely, you can feel it's been played in. But it's not too dissimilar to kind of like that immediate picking up a guitar and going, that's, that's it for me. Uh, I don't think like uh, like the like the, the the 62 has been played every day of its life since the original uh, owner Malcolm he bought it in uh, when he bought it he's played it for all those years and it feels like it's been played for all those years it's just got something about it but is that different to picking up this guitar and feeling how this feels well, not not really because they both feel brilliant if that makes any sense, I don't know. I, I don't know. I could be talking really weird here, but um, the way the 62 feels is heavenly, but the way this guitar feels is heavenly, and the way the Hofner Very Thin feels is nice, you know, and the way the Les Paul feels is nice sometimes to me. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. You know, I, th I do think it's more of a bonding period. Like certain instruments, you'll just you'll just gravitate to it and you'll stick to like glue immediately. Some you have to work out a bit and then it'll work out and then some you'll work out forever and it'll never work out. I also had a 50s reissue Stratocaster, Mexican reissue 50s Strat that I tried with for about a year and I tried everything on that guitar to get it to play right for me. And I tried for a year to get this guitar to work and it didn't work and I sold it and the guy who owns it loved it and never had any problems with it. I also used to have a Kramer, uh, a Kramer Pacer it was. And um, loved the guitar to bits. It had a foiled rose and it was great fun, but it never worked for me. So I gave it away to a friend of mine and he gave it to his brother, and his brother loves it. And you know, he's never had any issues with the guitar. So, um, you know, be that for what it is, kind of, you know, at the end of the day. But I do feel it's more of a bonding period than a breaking in period, definitely. You know, you, you either, you know, you, you bond with the guitar straight away or, you know, or you don't, kind of thing, and you have to work it or, you know, or it doesn't work out. Um, you know, it, it's a strange thing. Instruments are funny things. They're, certain ones will work, some, some, some certain ones won't. And I think that's kind of like really important to kind of like, you know, to try as much as you can of everything, you know, it, given, the, you know given, the, given the opportunity and the chance to do so. Um, because you kind of get to learn what you like and what you don't like. And um, when you pick up something, you'll immediately know whether you like it or you don't like it, or if it's going to work or if it isn't going to work, so to say. Um, to a point where you could almost buy blind as long as you kind of know what it kind of is, so to say. But I say there is, you know, there is a difference between a brand new guitar and a warning guitar, definitely. Like I say, this, you know, is definitely different to the 62, and the 62 is different to this. But they both feel great to play, and at the end of the day, that's that's it. You know, that, do they feel great to play? Do they feel like an extension of you? As long as they do, 
then that's fine. Yep, different neck shapes, different fretwork, different radiuses, different strings, all sorts of those different gauges of string, all those kind of things will come as factors. But I think it's more of a case of do you bond with the instrument? Does it speak to you, you know, internally? Does it, does it do what you want it to do? Does it sound the way you can hear it to sound? You know, all those kind of things come in, I think, more than kind of just like, you know, I'm going to play this for a year and it'll feel different. You know, it'll feel different because you got used to it. You know, some guitars will never feel different. My, my white strap um, has never felt different. In all the years I've owned my white strap, it, it, it feels the same now as it did then. And it's had uh, three refrets and uh, it's never, sorry, two refrets. Yes, two refrets. And uh, it still feels the same as it did when I bought it. You know, um, I say the only difference is the neck feels smoother because I've took all the, the lacquer off. It's not so sticky. But other than that, the guitar still does what I know where it can. I know what it can do and what it can't do. It. it, it I, m I remember watching an Anderton's video with Bernie Marsden. Bernie Marsden said, as long as he's got his 59, the Beast, Les Paul, he can plug into anything. Any amp you give him, he'll plug into it and he'll get his sound because he knows what that guitar can do. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, you, you just, you just, you learn what it does and you learn what it doesn't do and you learn how it sounds and you learn how to kind of like make it sound, so to say. I don't know, I've probably gone off on a massive tangent here. Anyway, YouTube people, I'd like to ask you the same question. Do you think there's a breaking period of instruments and uh, does it have any advantages or disadvantages? I say, I can only speak from my perspective, so I'd love to hear all of your perspectives as well. Love reading your comments. So, uh, Put a comment in below. You also asked, uh, what are any up good upgrades to guitars? Uh, depends. I'm one of those people, like I say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So regardless of, you know, what upgrades might be good, if, say if it's just it's, it's like a, a, a Squire Bullet. If a Squire Bullet's great, there's no point changing anything. But it depends what you want, really. If a machine heads aren't working, it's falling out of tune, you know, machine heads, you know, are kind of, you know, kind of important. But... If, if if your guitar's fine and it does what you want it to do, don't touch it. You know, don't 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 meddle with with, with something that's right. It, I, I just don't I just don't see the point of that really. M myself, you know, I'm I'm not really a tinker. I'm I'm terrible with a soldier and I, and and messing around with guitars. But I've never really felt the need to tinker too much with guitars. You know, most of my guitars I've bought because that's the way I want them to be. If that, make, that makes any sense, apart from some part cast, parts casters uh, that I've made in the past, where I've had to kind of like you know put parts in and whatnot. But um, but parts to upgrade, uh, it, it varies guitar to guitar. If the pickups don't do what you want to do, change pickups. If machine heads don't work very well, change the machine heads. It's just when and needed more than anything else. If it's not broke, don't fix it though. That that'd be my um, little ten p in the in the pot, so to say there. Um, but yeah, I mean, upgrades are, are all very, very subjective to, to, to the instrument and, and to yourself and, and what you want uh, for the guitar to do. But if a guitar plays and sounds the way you want it to, don't mess with it. Because, you know, you can... Sometimes you can mess with something and you can't come back from that. So uh, so just bear that in mind. Um, but again, this is all, all my own opinions. You know, you, you don't have to listen to me. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, hope that's answered your question. I'm going to move on to question three now. Okay, so question three, we've got a couple of sections in question three. Uh, any opinion on, have you any opinions on Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds uh, music and Liam Gallagher's solo stuff or BDI? Uh, this is part A of uh, question three. Um, yeah, I, I liked, I don't really like Noel's new stuff. Um, I don't, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon of, of, of kind of like, you know, trying to put it down. I just, it doesn't appeal to me as much as like the other stuff does. Uh, the first two albums, uh, Chasing Yesterday and I can't remember the first High Flying Birds album. Did it even have a title? Was it self-titled? I don't know. Um, the first High Flying Birds album I really loved and the second one I really loved. There's some great, awesome songs on there. I absolutely adore some of the songs on that album and his, his stuff is amazing. But his third solo album, the newest one out, I'm not a fan of. I just, I just can't, I can't find anything in it apart from Dead in the Water, which is only a bonus track. But other than that, I can't find, no, nothing kind of appeals to me. It doesn't kind of like, 
like I said earlier on, he doesn't kind of go inside and, and, and kind of move me in any way. So his newer stuff, not so much. His older stuff, definitely. You know, uh, I love songs like uh, uh, River Man and stuff like that. It's, it's, they're just awesome. They're just awesome songs. The man's a machine when it comes down to writing songs. But, um, but yeah, his new stuff I'm not so much a big fan of. I'm not going to say it's terrible, because I'm sure some people love it. I just personally, it just doesn't appeal to me. Um, Liam Solo stuff, yeah, same thing again. It's, it's okay, but um, it's not knocking on the back door of Definitely Maybe or, or Be Here Now or What's the Story of Morning Glory. It's, it's, not that, it's not knocking on the back of those CDs, really. Um, it's okay. But again, it, it doesn't really appeal to me as much as, as I say, you know, old, older like Oasis stuff, or, or or even like you know the first two albums of Noel's solo uh, career. Um, it's cool that Liam's out there doing it again. Though I think that's wicked. I think it's cool that he's actually out there, and I love that there's like a little video of him somewhere where he's making a cup of tea, and he's like, "I used to have a guy to do this for me. This is your fault." And I love that. It's hysterical. Love the man. He's mental, but it's great. Okay, so uh, so yeah, um, Noel's high flying bird stuff, early stuff, yeah, newer stuff, not so much. The last album I don't really like; it doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, Liam Solo stuff, yeah, ish, it, it, it's okay, but again, it's not really appealing to me. BDI didn't appeal to me at all. Um, I just couldn't get on with it. it. It just didn't. Again, it didn't. It didn't affect me. It didn't move me in any way. So I, I couldn't. I can't really say anything about that. But again, that, that's my opinion on that. Uh, you also asked, uh, what is a good gigging amp for an Oasis tone, but we'll also clean, clean up for a Johnny Marr tone for around 200, 250 quid. Um, PV Bandit Red Stripe, uh, the Marshall MG uh, 100 DFX. There's also, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will say the Boss Katana. I've yet to try a Boss Katana. I really want to try one. I'm like, you know, I've got like itchy fingers. Um, to actually try a Boscatana, but I say there's, there's I don't know anybody who owns one, and I can't afford to buy one right now uh, through certain things that have come up. And um, so, um, so yeah, I'd would, I would probably you know stick with those three: Boscatana, PV Bandit, Red Stripe. You can find one, and a Marshall MG 100 DFX combo, um, because you can kind of get your Oasis kind of sound out of the the, the lead channel on the Bandit and the dirty channel of the, of the Katana and, and the Marshall. But you can also kind of use the clean channel or OD1 on the Marshall or the vintage setting on the PV Bandit to kind of get that kind of cleaner Johnny Marr kind of sound. And the really cool thing about the Boss Katana or the Marshall MG is you've got an inbuilt chorus, which will help for those Johnny Marr moments. You know, so, um, so yeah, those three, I say the PV Bandit Red Stripe, you're going to, you know, you'd have to buy kind of external effects for that, like delay and, and this and the other. Whereas, you know, the, the Katana and the, and the MG DFX, they've already got uh, inbuilt effects, so you don't really have to worry about that so much. So they're, they're, they're the three I'd recommend. People of the Tube, what would you recommend for an Oasis slash Johnny Martone? Uh, help this fellow out as well with me. Uh, and your last part of question three is, um, do you have an opinion on Glenn Frick's uh, Spectre Sound Studios? Not really, no. Um, I don't really have an opinion, so I, I can't really say anything on that. I'm, I, I, don't really got, I don't really got anything to say on that. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, um, I, I don't want to kind of like get into that kind of like, you know, this, that, and the other. I, I don't really kind of watch that channel I don't watch you watch his channel so I can't I can't really comment it's not really fair for me to say anything so I don't really watch his channel so I don't really have an opinion I can't really say honestly if I like him dislike him or whatever so uh so yeah um I hope that's answered your question anyway um like I say people of the tube what amp would you recommend uh let's help this fellow out and uh yeah let's move on to uh question four now is it four Yes, it is question four. Ha ha. Okay, so question four is, I recently bought a Strat, and when I play it through my Boss OS2, it doesn't sound as good as my Epiphone Les Paul. Why is this? And also, I recently bought a Box V845 wire pedal, uh, but it's really hard to turn on. Can this be adjusted? Uh, yeah, right. Okay, uh, so... Um, yeah, I mean, you, when you're playing a humbucker guitar and your amp set up for that, when you switch to a semicolon, it's it's never going to sound the same. You'll have to just mess with it and tweak, and um, you know, and, and and find a kind of maybe even a mid ground between a, a between a humbucker and a single coil, so uh, both of them work when you plug them in. But um, 
you know, different pickups, different guitars, they're going to sound different. But uh, so what I, what I would say is just literally just kind of spend the spend the spend the bit of time just kind of like you know messing around with different sounds with different guitars. Like get get plug in like say your Epiphone and go well, you know and mess with it and go oh yeah I really like that sound. And then plug in the Strat and play your Strat and then find out why don't you like that sound? What is it about that sound? Is it too trebly because the humbuckers are darker? Are you boosting the treble or the mids? You know um, and then lower the treble. And maybe boost the mids and see if can, like, you can find a mid ground between them. But it's just going to come down to tweaking and spending time with both instruments and finding what you like and what you don't like, so to say. Yeah, you'll you'll get there eventually. But it, yeah, it just if if it's a new instrument to you, again, it's like I was saying earlier on, you, you've got to learn its ins and outs, so to say. It'll, it'll um, say sometimes. Excuse me. Sometimes it'll take time. Sometimes it'll happen straight away. Sometimes it it, it won't happen. You know, if I'm being honest, sometimes it just doesn't happen. That's the way it is. But um, but yeah, um, just tweak about, just mess about with each guitar and kind of go between them, kind of a a being, and well, through through your pedal and and, and through your amp and, and just kind of see what sounds you like with the Strat and what sounds you like with your uh, your Epiphone and just kind of like try and find if you want to use both, try and find that mid ground where like you know, well. I really like my Epiphone more, but the Strat sounds really nice on this setting, but the Epiphone sounds better. And as long as they're like within that close distance, you'll be fine. As long as they're not kind of like, you know, the Epiphone sounds great, the Strat sounds terrible. As long as they're not kind of far away, you'll be okay. But um, yeah, but it, yeah, there's, no, there's, nothing more, there's nothing more fun than turning on your amp and turning on your pedals and plugging in, plugging in the guitar and just messing about for, for as long as you can, as long as you're allowed, um, should I say. Um, you know, and just finding different sounds is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd recommend on that. Uh, the whole Vox v, V845 thing, how hard it's turned on. Yeah, um, under the... Uh, if, you, if, you, if you think of your pedal like this, so this is your kind of like, you know, your wah of it. Wah, wah. Um, anyway, yeah, if, if this is your kind of pedal, so to say, under this part, under the under your, under, basically under your toes, there'll be two rubber washers. Well, not washers, but like two little rubber feet that are sit under where your toes are on the pedal. Uh, cut them off. It's the old Jimi Hendrix trick. Jimmy used to do this. Uh, get rid of those rubber spacers under the toe of the wire pedal, under the side. Just get rid of them. You can normally pull them off, and if you can't pull them off, just get a knife and be really careful and cut them off so they're gone, so they're just flat. And you will find immediately the wire pedal will turn on infinitely easier and it's a lot more fun. You do have to be careful though because it's so uh, so easy to turn on uh, when you are wiring away. When you go like full tilt, you know, you can, if you're not careful, kind of turn it off mid solo. So just be aware of that. But again, because the switch is so easy, you can turn it back on really fast. But, um, but yeah, just be aware that, that that's one of the issues you'll have with it. But I say, this is what I do to all my wire pedals, is just lock those feet off. There's little rubber spacers, they're just totally pointless. Um, oddly enough, I did it on my Crybaby, and my Crybaby ceased to, like, just hated it. Absolutely hated it. So I did the Zach Wilde trick, and I put a penny on the underside of the uh, the, to the toe down thing, and it just helps um, push the pedal, uh, push the uh, button in. But, um, but yeah, that's what I would recommend, is lock those little rubbish rubber spaces off because that's what Jimi Hendrix did that's how Jimmy could turn his warp off and on so quick but um that's another video altogether but yeah um so yeah, like I say you know just tweak around yeah you know, with your guitars find that mid kind of ground between both of them and uh you know there will be a mid ground one way or another and try different pickup select selections as well on your strat like you know try position two uh you know be out of phase where it's the uh, the bridge and the middle pickup on together you know, or try neck and middle, or just, or just middle, or, or, or whatever. Try different kind of thingies until you find that mid-ground of going, right, well, the Strat sounds great now, the Epiphone sounds great now, I'm sorted. So, uh, yeah, just, just tweak about and have, have fun with it more than anything. So, uh, yeah, I uh, hope that's such a question. Uh, moving on to question five now. Okay, so question five today is on so many videos, people say the key to John Fushant is style, is playing in triads. What's your opinion on this, and would you suggest learning triads up and down the neck? Um... I would say, yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, they, they've got a point, you know, if you take songs like, you know, Do, 
ghost, stuff like that. It, you know, and then there's a lot of kind of like, um, let me turn the reverb off. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that where just, they're just kind of triads. But John style is more than just triads. That's like, that's like one of the one of the, the things that makes up John. You know, I, I feel that's it's almost like a lazy way of describing John. And people say like, you know, I've seen people talk about stuff like Under the Bridge where he's doing this. Well, you know what he's doing. I don't have to explain that. You're not silly people, are you? Silly Dave, more like. Anyway, yeah, there's people who are explaining like, you know, and they see John kind of doing chords like that. And they say, oh, he's just playing a triad because he's playing three notes. No, he's not, because he's got his thumb over. And he's playing the bass note as well, so it's technically four notes. And if he's playing the high E, you know, it's five notes. You know, so he's not playing the triad. You know, they're not triads. You know, that's a triad. This isn't. You know, you can hear the difference, one's bigger and one isn't. So... I think it's more of a kind of like a quick and easy way to just kind of pick John's part style apart but it's not I wouldn't agree with it I, John does play a lot of the triads definitely there's a lot of those kind of um, you know you know there's a lot of that but that's only a certain section of John's playing you know there's a lot more to John's playing than just that this single note lines uh, if you take something like um uh, like Warlocks off Stadium Arcadium or, uh, or Tommy Baby you know there's a lot there's a lot more to John's player and there's, there's then there's his soloing there's you know his phrasing there's all sorts of these things so just to sum up John Stalin just oh he just uses triads mm, I think that's a kind of a cop out to be honest with you I think that's a bit that's kind of like taking the easy kind of maybe even a bit of a lazy route to, to describe John's style because there's a lot more to him than that you know you can't just say oh he just does triads learn your triads and you'll be a player like John it doesn't work that way you know because because if, you, if you're explaining it that way you could explain that Jimi Hendrix used a lot of those kind of things but he didn't you know there's a lot more to Jimi Hendrix than there is on that and you know it's like describing Steve Ray Vaughan as just you know your bog standard blues guitarist who just played blues pentatonics no there's a lot more to it than that you know there's a lot more to to that that you can kind of see so to say that that people don't necessarily delve into um and i feel that's always kind of a bit of a bit of a shame you know and and same with like you know with john for shanty you know it's not just triads there's so much more yes learning triads up and down the neck will help you understand certain things about john's playing but only that much when there's like this much to learn you know triads is about that you've got soloing you've got phrasing you've got tone you've got so many things that make up John being John um, you know you've also got kind of like you know his wah wah style and all sorts of stuff it's like so but I, I know I know what you mean I've seen a lot of videos out there on, on Josh I've watched quite a few videos I, I know what you mean on Josh Shanty and a lot of people just say oh it's just it's just triads and it's just this and I've seen people playing under the bridge like this <laughs> and he just decide well that's not how he plays it if you watch him play it you know his thumb comes over top he gets It's a fuller sound. Triads are kind of nice in a certain respect, and John does use them a lot. But there are so much more. There's so much more, and I just find it's kind of like you know, it's just kind of like um, it's just like the, it's like a tiny section. The whole triad thing of John. But learning your triad shapes is really cool. I mean, if like you know, if you think of like D minor, you got you know shape there, shape there, you know, and a the shape there. If you learn those, it gives your ability more as well. It gives your chordal playing more options. And it will give you an idea of some of the things that John does, like um, 1999, 2000, kind of, if you have to ask, kind of jam, like I said, like... You know, it 
gives you those kind of things and tries to do those kind of funk things. But again, there's so much more to John than this single note line. You know, into soloing and speeding up, slowing down, being expressive. Um, so yeah, just to, I know what you mean. Summing up John Starlin, Dustin Triad is, is just a, is a cop out in my opinion. It's just no, it's just John's more. John is a lot more. Same as like you know, you can't say you can't just go, oh, Jimi Hendrix did this, this, and this, and that's what he did. No, he didn't. You know, Steve Ray Vaughan wasn't just your box standard pentatonic blues player, and neither was Peter Green, and you know, um, Kirk Cobain was just you know, he was just this rubbish guitar player. No, they weren't. There was so much more than that. You know. The, the, and you have to delve deep to find these things because you can just look at it from the surface and say well he's just doing this and that's it but it's not that that's only surface that's literally the brushing the surface it's like an iceberg you know the tall triad thing of John Shanty is like what you can see of the iceberg and then the rest of it is uh, underneath and you can't that you can't see there's, there's so much more and the same with any 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 iconic guitar player, really. There's always something else you can learn from them. I'm still learning things from John now. I'm still learning things from Jimi Hendrix now. I'm still learning things from like Kirk Bain and Billy Joe now. You know, and, and these people have been playing their music and studying them for absolutely years, and it, you, you always learn something new. Um, so yeah, uh, the whole triad thing, yeah, it's a bit of a cop out in my opinion. I think it's just kind of like, you know, you're condensing something, and you but you're missing out everything. You know, you're right, he does use a lot of triads, but you are missing out a lot of it and a lot of the point of John's playing, so to say. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, be that, be, be, be that for what it is. But, yeah, again, my opinions, whatever that's worth, whatever whatever my silly opinions worth. But, um, but yeah, learning triads up and down the net is, is good anyway. You know, regardless of playing like John Prashanti, it, it, it's a good thing to kind of learn... <laughs> to learn those shapes other than that because it gives you more ability to think on the spot if somebody's playing a chord progression where it's you know A minor F C and G it gives you the ability to go right well okay so instead of just mimicking that I can go go you know it gives you that ability to kind of mess around with that kind of thing you know and Johnny Marr does stuff like that so yeah be that for what it may anyway um yeah, I hope that's actually a question. Uh, I hope I'm rambled on for too long about that. Uh, Going to move on to final question of the day now. Question six. Okay, last question of the day. I like this one. Um, uh, if you could, uh, if you could own only one Strat, what pickups would you choose? Huh? Um. Good gravy. Um. Now that's a difficult question. I think the pickups I would pick I don't know I really don't know if, if, if you put a gun to bed and say right you can pick you know one pickup for the rest of your life what would it be it would have to be just the Tex-Mex pickups I've got in my white strap because they're the ones excuse me that when I plug a guitar in with those pickups it just is that sound because I've had that because I've had my white strap for so long my ears has become accustomed to that pickup um, and as a result I just love that sound you know I, I, I'm a, like I say I'm a, I'm a creature of habit once I find something I like I don't really deviate from it at all I stick to my kind of like you know stick to it like glue so um, so yeah probably with text specs because I love text specs because I really do Especially the older ones, like I say, I've got in my white strap, that's from 2002. The ones from around that period, Joe's got a guitar. She's got a Pretend Defender guitar. It's I've, I've demoed it a long time ago. It's like a, a black relic strap. And um, that's got the same pickups in, and it's, they're just incredible. They just sound like that strap thing. And, um, and, and I'm like comparison of, like, g g comparison them. Comparing them, Dave. Great English. Um, yeah, comparing them to like say some original uh, '60s pickups, uh, they're very close in my opinion. Like, it, it, to my ear, they're, they're, they're the closest to the old the old pickups. Um, but yeah, I think I'll have them. 
you know, I really do. I really do think I'd have them because, I, like I said, I just find they're the closest to that kind of strat sound I hear in my head, so to say. So yeah, um, Tex-Mex pickups. There you go. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely, absolutely. The, all the Tex-Mex pickups. I think it's there's just some crazy weird magic in the mind, absolutely. The okay, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, people of the tube, if you could have one strap. What pickups would you have in it? Leave your comments below. Like I say, love to read your comments. Love your questions, everybody. It's absolutely awesome. Really cool. And like I said, I just hope I can answer them well enough. But anyway, um, really hope you enjoyed this video. Like I say, I really hope I answered your questions okay. Um, any answers, you know, uh, haven't done well enough, you can come on and beat me up. No, you can't, I'm joking. I don't want to get beaten up. I will fight you with this guitar. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed uh, Q&A Wednesday today, uh, this week. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again on Friday. I have two guitars to show you on Friday uh, that have come into my possession. Uh, one is the 70s Strat, which is uh, actually in... in no, yeah, I'll tell you where. I'm the 70s Strat that you've seen is a uh, an Ibanez copy from the early 70s. It's a pre-lawsuit. Uh, Ibanez. Um, it took me a long time to kind of find out what, exactly what it was, but it's a pre-lawsuit Ibanez. But um, somebody has loved, but they've chopped it about a lot. There's been a lot. There's a lot done to it. And I'll explain more about that on Friday. And another guitar that's coming to possession. My friend Richard has given me given me parts, and I've recently just put together a parts caster, and uh, I'll show you that on Friday as well. So um, yeah, Friday's going to be a guitar day, everybody. Two two guitars in one video day. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you again. Have a great morning, afternoon, and evening. Goodbye now. I always do that. I don't know why. Hey, right. goodbye. Bye.